Okay, in this lesson we will talk about spam or unwanted commercial email. Now you might not think that you receive a lot of spam, but the fact of the matter is that most of it goes to your spam folder. So one might think, what's the problem? Well, in fact, spam remains a scourge for network operators. In particular, someone has to design the filters that separate the good traffic from the bad traffic. Additionally, even if email is classified as spam, if it's accepted for delivery, the Internet's mail protocols dictate that the server has to keep the mail because it's told the receiver that it has accepted the mail. This creates the potential for spam to consume a significant amount of storage space on email servers. Finally, spam can create security problems for users who receive spam emails if the spam messages contain a payload that could be harmful, such as malware or a phishing attack or an attempt to steal a user's private or sensitive information, such as a password. Now, even though you don't see the mail because of these filters, something like 95% of all email traffic is spam. Some reports from the anti-phishing working group suggest that something like one in every 87 emails was a phishing attack. And there's something like 50,000 unique phishing attacks in a month. A common approach for getting rid of spam messages is to filter. In other words, prevent the message from reaching the user's inbox in the first place. Now this begs the question of how to differentiate spam or the bad messages from ham or the legitimate messages. There are three different ways to construct filters. One is content-based. In other words, you can look at what's being said in the mail. For example, if the mail contains particular words, such as Viagra or Rolex, a content-based filter might pick up on those terms and decide to filter the mail. Second, a filter might make a decision about whether an email message is spam or ham based on the IP address of the sender. This method is often called blacklisting. Third, we can construct filters based on behavioral features or how the mail is sent. So for example, if the mail is sent at a particular time of day or if it's sent in a batch of emails that are all roughly the same size, then we may be able to figure out that a message is likely spam simply based on the sender's sending behavior. Now each of these approaches are complementary, but content-based filtering and IP-based filtering each have problems. Content-based filters are relatively easy for attackers to evade. A recent large commercial mail operator recently told me that he saw something like 80,000 different spellings of Viagra. But additionally, messages can be carried not only in text, but in images, Excel spreadsheets, or even MP3s or movies. Therefore, spammers can easily alter the features of an email's content and adjust those features and change them to evade content-based filters. On the flip side, those maintaining the filters suffer a relatively high cost because the filters must be continually updated as content changes and the means of carrying the content becomes more sophisticated. So as a quick quiz, what are some problems with content-based email filters? Are they too slow? Are they easy for attackers to evade? Or are words in text of emails difficult to parse? In this case, please choose the single best answer. As we discussed, content-based filters are easy for attackers to evade because they can very easily change the content of the message that is carrying the spam that they wish to deliver. They can embed their message in things like images, MP3s, Excel spreadsheets, and so forth, making it relatively difficult for the filter maintainers to keep up. So we've talked about problems with content-based filtering. What about IP blacklists? Well, first, the way an IP blacklist works is that when a sender sends an email to the receiver, the receiver sends a query for that IP address to a blacklist or a DNS-based blacklist, sometimes called a DNSBL, such as Spamhouse. Depending on whether or not that IP address appears in the blacklist, the receiver can then decide to accept the message, or if the IP address turns out to be on the blacklist, the receiver can decide to terminate the connection and not even accept the mail in the first place, thereby saving the operator the trouble of even having to store the message. The third approach is to filter a message on how it is sent. In particular, we can look at such features as the geographic locations of the sender and receiver, the set of target recipients, the sender's upstream ISP, or our inference as to whether the sender 
is a member of a botnet or a network of compromised hosts that are doing the bidding of some command and control server. Now the challenges of building a filter around this notion is first, understanding network level behavior, and second, building classifiers using network level features to execute the filtering. A surprising finding from our earlier work is that spammers can perform behavior on the network that is extremely uncanny and unlikely to be performed by a legitimate network user. For example, what we saw is that the spammer could hijack an IP prefix for a very short period of time, such as 10 minutes, send the spam or potentially multiple spam messages from IP addresses inside that IP prefix, and at the end of the attack, withdraw the prefix. This allows attackers to use ephemeral IP addresses, essentially rendering IP blacklists ineffective. In fact, we saw on any given day about 10% of the email senders are from previously unseen IP addresses. This ephemerality or transience of the IP addresses of the spam senders makes it particularly difficult to maintain a blacklist. In fact, we found many single packet features that tended to work well. In other words, features that a receiver could make a decision on just based on the first packet that a sender sends. Such single packet features include the distance between the sender and the receiver, the density in IP space in terms of how many other mail senders are nearby, and the local time of day at the sender. Other features, such as the AS of the sender's IP, also worked well. If we're willing to look beyond a single packet and look at a single message, the number of recipients and the length of the message also proved to be effective in distinguishing spammers from legitimate senders. Finally, we can look at aggregates. For example, if we're willing to look at a group of email messages, we can see how message length varies over time or across a group of different messages. Putting these features together in a system called SNARE, or Spatiotemporal Network Level Automated Reputation Engine, achieved a 70% detection rate for a false positive rate of about one-tenth of one percent. This level of accuracy is good enough to be used in practice. It provides comparable performance to state-of-the-art IP-based blacklists such as Spam House, but it only uses network-level features, thus making it less susceptible to the ephemeral nature of IP-based blacklisting. 